were laughing at your birthday slide. Sorry. There's a couple errors on there. Somebody's gone to glory on there. <laughs> turned it down the other day because it was too loud. Can you hear me now? Let's just try let's just try a chorus. Let's see what happens. Ready? Okay, Ben. <clears throat> you say the same through the Oh, from the beginning. Okay. <laughs>
instrumentalists. Tracy Jenks, I want to welcome you to East Lake Road Alliance Church. And if you are an overachiever, you've already got your welcome, car your uh, communication card filled out. If you haven't done that, take this time to do it now. Um, this you can tear off, put it in the offering plate. This is how we can keep track of what prayer requests you have, what things you might be interested in. Uh, there's lots of things to get involved in, and a lot of the opportunities are listed here. And uh, that's one of the things that I love about this church is there's something for everybody to get involved in. And um, I guess I'm only supposed to say one of my favorite things, but my second favorite thing is um, I love coming to service and leaving feeling like I know what to do that week to improve myself. And I, I don't want to leave just kind of feeling ho-hum. And when I was church shopping five years ago, I went to one church that I was like, well, that was okay, but I don't really feel any different. And then I came here, and I haven't left. So um, if this is your first time, I hope you'll come back again. And for those of you who have been coming regularly, I know why. Do we have a video also? Ready? No? Okay. We did have a, um, we were talking about doing another promo for Marquis. Is, is it Marquis or Marcus? 
Marquis Laughlin. Anyways, he will be here the week before Palm Sunday, and we, we encourage you to invite your friends and neighbors uh, that do not know Christ so that they can hear the Gospel of John. He's going to give us a great um, drama. It's, it's drama. I mean, if you saw that last week, we actually didn't play that. We don't have that, Anne? Didn't we have a promo? Okay, we have to get a new video, but I'm, I'm sure you can actually um, look at him on YouTube also, you know, and I think that way you can kind of get an idea of what he's doing. It's wonderful to see a sea of red and pink out there, and happy Valentine's Day to you, but this is a day that we can celebrate the love that our Savior just freely bestows on us, and we can love back on him. Let's stand together as we sing, Love Lifted Me. bestowed on us. This morning we're going to introduce a new song to you. Many of you already know this song. It says, Your love never fails. In Romans 8, 28 it says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. It also says in Psalm 136, 1, Praise the Lord, he is good.
Jesus, we just thank you this morning that we can just love you freely because of the love that you have bestowed upon us for the blood shed on the cross that saves us from our sins. Oh, love divine. Oh, all the love that exceeds all loves. Oh, Lord, we honor you this morning. And we pray, we thank you that your love never gives up. It never runs out on us. And that you work all things together for our good. Oh, you love us so much, Jesus. And this morning, we give you a little token back. Through our praise, we pray that you know how much we love you. It's in your name we pray. sing again about that unfailing love for us. Worship team. 
Well, I've got to thank these musicians, especially today. You know, that was a wonderful uh, uh, set of songs that we, we sang. It really takes all the pressure off the pastor when you get the gospel right at the beginning through the songs. I could preach a real dud of a message today. You've already got the truth. Amen. We've been saturated in the truth. Why don't we let them know how much we love them? The musicians are just so great at East Lake Road Alliance Church. Thank you so much. Your love never fails, never gives up. It never runs out on me. It reminds me what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In that great love chapter, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Now listen, if you're here this morning and you never heard this before, Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves you. He wants to be in a love relationship with you. And if you don't know him as your personal Savior, you don't know him as Lord of your life, let me tell you, you don't know what you're missing. He loves you. Praise his holy name. Will you join your hearts with mine as we seek the Lord together in prayer this morning? Precious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the truth, the truth that you love us. Not that we loved you first, but that you loved us first. Wow, what a thrilling thought. As we think about these wonderful truths, it just humbles us, Lord God, to know that the creator of the universe, the God who owns everything, loves us. Wow. Thank you for loving us. Thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity to come into this place again this morning, this Valentine's Day, to remember the love that you have for us. Thank you for the opportunity to bask in the presence of that love through fellowship of believers who love the Lord and love each other. Thank you for the fellowship of the Holy Spirit that reminds us of all these truths. Truly, we are a blessed people. Lord, we're reminded once again on this day of our shut-ins, our elderly, Lord God, we never want to forget them. We pray, Lord God, that you would be very real to them, that they would experience that same love that we experience in this place. We know, Lord God, so many of them, the deepest desire of their heart would be to be here today. If they could just be here, we ask you, Lord God, to be very real to them. We're reminded that we've got people in the hospital this morning, Lord God. We would pray that you would bless and keep them. Others recovering from surgery at home, Lord God, that you would be very real to them. And Lord, we pray now as we go through the rest of our time together in this place that the spirit of love, Lord God, and fellowship would just permeate our very being and that we would be changed, Lord God, by our encounter with you this morning. We pray all of these things in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, Sanctifier, Healer, and soon-coming King. We love you, Lord, and all God's people said, Amen, amen, and amen. We're going to ask the men to come forward to prepare to collect the morning tithes and offerings. Again, want to remind you about that uh, fellowship card. Get it off, and get it out of the bulletin, place it in the offering plate. If you've got any questions or any needs, if you need special prayer, you'd like a visit, any of those kinds of things, please get them in there and we'll make sure we follow up with you. Larry, would you ask a blessing on the offering?
church. All right. Yeah, I do want to remind you there's a lot of things going on at East Lake Road Alliance Church over the next couple of months. You want to make sure you get those on your calendar. And this Marquis Laughlin, uh, really a great opportunity for you to invite uh, someone to come. What he does is he, he, he does a dramatic presentation word for word from the book of John for us. And it's really a powerful presentation. Uh, as Lisa said, you can check him out, Marquis Laughlin. You can check him out on YouTube. And uh, he's really wonderful. Uh, again, we encourage you to invite some folks. And that Palm Sunday dinner, use that opportunity also to invite some people to East Lake Road uh, Alliance Church. Okay. Now, what we want to do uh, this morning is we're going to continue uh, this Abraham series. We've only got a few more sermons to preach here. Uh, last week, you recall, we went up to Mount Moriah and we uh, began to look at that message, that wonderful message about Mount Moriah, holy ground. Uh, we're going to not go back there today. We might get back there next week. We'll see how the Lord leads us today. Because it's Valentine's Day, we want to talk about a biblical story of love. Now, when you talk about a biblical story of love, actually, you could go anywhere in the Bible in any one of the passages that we have, anything that Jesus wrote or the, uh, put down for us to remember him by, it's a love story. We could go anywhere. But today we're going to look at this account in Genesis chapter 24, and it's a rather lengthy account, so we're going to jump right into it, and we're going to talk about uh, Rebecca and Isaac in this story of love. We find it in Genesis chapter 24. We're going to begin reading in verse one, and then we're going to jump through the chapter. So follow along with me as we begin reading in Genesis chapter 24, beginning in verse 1. Abraham was now old and well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. He said to the chief servant in his household, the one in charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I am living, but will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. The servant asked him, What if the woman is unwilling to come back with me to this land? Shall I then take your son back to the country you came from? Make sure that you do not take my son back there, Abraham said. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household and my native land, and who spoke to me and promised me on oath, saying, To your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angels before you, so that you can get a wife for my son from there. If the woman is unwilling to come back with you, then you will be released from this oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of his master Abraham and swore an oath to him concerning his master. Now we're jumping down to verse 12. Then he prayed, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, give me success today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a girl, please let down your jar that I may have a drink, and she says, drink, and I'll water your camels too, let her be the one who you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Before he had finished praying, Rebekah came out with her jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. The girl was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever lain with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. The servant hurried to meet her and said, Please give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered her jar to her hands and gave him a drink. After she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too until they have finished drinking. Now let's jump over to verse 54. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night there. When they got up the next morning, he said, Send me on my way to my master. But her brother and mother replied, Let the girl remain with us ten days or so, then you may go. But he said to them, Do not detain me, 
now that the Lord has granted success to my journey. Send me on my way so I may go to my master. Then they said, let's call the girl and ask her about it. So they called Rebecca and asked her, will you go with this man? I will go, she said. So they sent their sister Rebecca on her way, along with her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men, and they blessed Rebecca. Now down to verse 62. Now Isaac had come from Beer Lahoy Roy, for he was living in the Negev. He went out to the field one evening to meditate, and as he looked up, he saw camels approaching. Rebecca also looked up and saw Isaac. She got down from her camel and asked the servant, Who is that man in the field coming to meet us? He is my master, the servant answered. So he took her veil, so she took her veil and covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac all he had done. Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother Sarah, and he married Rebekah. She became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, once again, we thank you. For this passage of Scripture, we thank you, Lord God, for all the Scripture, Genesis to Revelation, a love letter, Lord God, to your creation. We pray, Lord God, as we look into this passage of Scripture this morning, that you would once again hide this poor preacher behind the Word of God and the cross of Christ. Speak to us, Lord God, by your Spirit's presence and the very Word itself. We love you, Lord, and pray all this to your glory. Amen. All right, a rather lengthy passage of Scripture, but we, what we have here, uh, what we've read, is an account of Abraham sending out his servant uh, to find a bride for his son Isaac. Abraham had been promised by God, you'll recall, that his descendants would become a great nation, as numerous as the stars. And so it's important to ensure that his son is married to a suitable person. We know that this promise was fulfilled, and Abraham's grandson then, Jacob, who had his name changed, had his name changed to Israel, would become the start of this great nation, fathering the twelve tribes of Israel, which included Judah, of course, where, we, where uh, Jesus Christ would come from in, in uh, uh, time. Abraham knew that Isaac's wife would be a part of that promise. Therefore, he sends his most most faithful servant to fulfill the task. Now, the servant isn't named here, but most uh, uh, scholars believe that it's Eliezer, the one that uh, was with Abraham uh, through much uh, of his life, taking care of him. He's faithful to the mission that he's called. He's praying continually, as we read, that God may grant him success and that God would show kindness to his master, Abraham. We read that the servant is successful. He brings back Rebekah to marry Isaac. And Rebekah is described um, as much loved and one who brings much comfort uh, to Isaac, even as he mourns the loss of his mother, Sarah. When we look into this account, we see a lot of uh, spiritual application going on here. Again, this is one of those accounts, as we near the end of Abraham's life, that so much of what had been happening throughout his life in this walk of faith comes to fruition right at the end of his life. And the truths are deep and broad as we look into this. What I want you to see here is this powerful picture of the Lord God the Father sending out his servant, the Holy Spirit, to find a bride for his son Jesus. We see that here very clearly. God the Father, like Abraham, wants the very best for his son Jesus. And Jesus, like Isaac, is the groom waiting for his bride. The Holy Spirit is like the faithful servant who carries out his master's work. The Bible tells us that the church is indeed the bride of Christ. Therefore, we are like uh, Rebecca, those of us who are born again like Rebecca in this story. Now, what I want to do for our time together this morning is really focus, especially uh, as it's Valentine's Day, focus on the love issue of this account. Focus on the question that um, was, uh, was asked of Rebecca. And I want to make spiritual application. Now, again, we want to remember that the spiritual application is the real application. We're reminded again that the scriptures tell us what is seen is temporary. 
but what is unseen is eternal. We need to get our minds on the spiritual things, the, the spiritual truths, and make application this morning. From a spiritual viewpoint, then, everything in life boils down to the very same question that was asked of Rebecca. We today, living on this side of Pentecost, we know that God the Father has indeed sent his Holy Spirit into the world to call out a bride for his son, Jesus Christ. And like Abraham's servant, the Holy Spirit comes not to promote himself, but he talks about Jesus, and he calls lost people to Christ for salvation. And he calls those of us who call ourselves Christians to a closer walk with the Lord. We call that sanctification. Those who have Jesus revealed to their hearts by the Holy Spirit and hear him ask, will you go with this man? And those who are saved and hear the Holy Spirit calling out to our hearts, will you go with this man? Will you take that next step of faith in your faith walk? They are faced with the greatest question that mankind will ever be faced with. And how we answer that question in the first place determines where we will spend our eternity. And how we answer that question as believers in Christ. Will we take the next step with Jesus? Will we go with this man? Will we go with him on our faith journey? Determines how we live our lives here. So it's a critical question. It's an important question. And it's one that we should be reminded of continually as the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts. So let's examine our scriptures today from Rebecca's standpoint. We might start by asking ourselves this question regarding Rebecca. Who is she? Who was Rebecca? And what did she know? What didn't she know? And what was she certain of? Because she took the walk of faith. Abraham sends his servant back to his own country for his bride. So the first thing that we notice about Rebecca is that she was family. She was family. He wouldn't allow his son to marry a Canaanite woman. What a powerful lesson. Before the law was given, Abraham knew not to take a wife from these Canaanite people. Why? Well, they had different gods. They lived by different rules. And it's the same today. What a what a powerful lesson for the church today about intermingling with the world, being unequally yoked. There's all a powerful lesson there. These people were a people that lived by different desires. They would have been a poor match for Abraham's son. They would have certainly contaminated the promise, the spiritual promise that Abraham had. Instead, the bride would have to come from amongst his own people. Powerful lesson here. In the same way, the Holy Spirit is sent out to search for a bride amongst God's own relatives. Now, this is a mystery. It's a mystery. Why does God open the hearts of some and let the hearts of others remain closed? What a mystery. But God is looking for a bride for Christ among his own people. The Bible says this, that when we put our faith in God, through His Son, Jesus Christ, we are born again into His family. It takes apart that whole notion. It blows that whole notion that we are all God's children. We are not all God's children. We are God's children when He calls us and we put our faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. We become then the same bloodline as His Son. We are therefore then eligible to be the bride of Christ. The first condition we see here for being picked to become the bride of Christ is to be born again. We can never enter God's promises except through the blood of Jesus Christ. So we never want to take lightly the call of the Holy Spirit on our hearts to become part of the family of God. We'll talk about that a little further along in the sermon. So she was family. What did she know? Well, she knew little of Isaac. Matter of fact, his name is not even mentioned to Rebecca. Did you get that? His name isn't even mentioned in this passage. But we know this, that the servant that Abraham sent had a long journey in front of him 
to talk to Rebekah about Isaac and to teach her about him. You see, she was going and, and without knowing who she was even going to meet, only that it was the son of Abraham. Not only that, but at the, at the well, she was willing to serve the master. I like that, by the way. I don't know how big that jar was Rebecca had, but can you imagine going back and filling it up to, to water the camels? And I don't know how much water camels drink, but I guarantee you that had to be a lot of effort. And she was willing to do it. And, of course, it proved the prayer of the uh, servant. So it's powerful. To a lost person. See, she had a long way to travel with the servant to learn about Isaac. She didn't know everything. And to a lost person, they don't know everything about Jesus Christ. I know before I came to the Lord, it took me a long time to come. I thank God that he finally moved me to make that decision. But I didn't know enough about him. I felt like I had to know more about him. Dear hearts, you don't have to know more about him than this. That he loves you. That he died for you. That he might bring you into the family of God. That's all you have to know. You just got to come. And then the servant, the Holy Spirit, will explain things to you along the way. What a wonderful, wonderful God we have. The Holy Spirit is in the teaching business. We don't have time to go into a lot of these verses, so I'm not going to be bringing them up, Steve, but we're going to uh, you know, just talk about what the Bible says. We will never get him all the way figured out, just like Rebecca couldn't get Isaac all the way figured out along the journey. So she didn't know much about him. She did know this, that Isaac was Abraham's heir. Everything Abraham owned is in the hands of his son Isaac. What a powerful picture again of the Lord, and the Father, and the Son. Now, we didn't read it, but in verses 35 and 36 in Genesis 24, Laban was very, uh, no, actually it's uh, verse 51. Ab uh, Laban was very interested in all this, and we read a lot more about Laban as he deals with Isaac's son later on in the account of Genesis. But Laban was interested in this. You have to see this at verse 51. Talk about a, 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 a brother, right? And, and, and we know that Laban later on, we know that Laban was really interested in the material things. But look what he said, uh, look what they say in verse 51. They say, here is Rebekah, take her and go. Once they, knew that, uh, <laughs> once they knew that Isaac possessed everything of Abraham's, they were willing to send her, man. We're marrying into some money here, right? We're getting some riches. And what a powerful truth for us when we come to know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, become a bride of Christ. All that, all that the Father has is, is ours through Jesus Christ. And the scope of this thought is unbelievable. Deuteron Let's so Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 14. Do we have that one? To get an idea. In Deuteronomy, it says, The Lord your God, to him belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. If we could just wrap our minds around this and claim it as our own, everything belongs to the Lord. Everything. Why? Because he created it. It's all his. Everything. And through Christ, we become joint heirs to all of those promises. What a powerful blessing God wants to bestow upon his children and the bride of his son, Jesus Christ. Do you realize that everything that God created, he gave to his son, Jesus? And that everything that Jesus has, he freely gives to us. We're joint heirs with Christ. Some of you get that. Wow. What a powerful thought. And I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyway, she knew little of him. She knew, though, that he was the heir. And she knows that he's looking to be married. In verses 34 through 39, Isaac <coughs> is looking for a bride. Now, on that day... It was every woman's desire to marry and have children. In that day, that's the way things worked. Actually, that's the way things worked in America up till I don't know, not that long ago. Now everybody's engaged and live together and, you know, they act like they're married, right? But in that day, marriage was critical. And she went, every woman's desire was to have children. So for Rebecca, the idea of this man coming to look for her must have been thrilling. Out of all the women... 
of all the women on the earth at that time, this rich, eligible bachelor has chosen her. He chose her. Now, again, this is one of those mysteries. And it reminds us again that we should not take the call of God to be saved or sanctified lightly. Again, before we knew him, he loved us and he sent his Holy Spirit to find us. Out of all the people on the earth. Again, it's one of the things that, that if you think about it, it's incomprehensible that God chose you if you're saved to be saved, to be a part of the bride of Christ. And yet, some of your family is not saved. Your friends, a lot of your friends are not saved. The people around you are not saved. Can you even begin to appreciate the fact that of all the people in the world, God chose you? Talk about love. Talk about being special. Oh, don't take it lightly. And if you're born again, and you're not walking with the Lord, the Holy Spirit will always push you to a closer walk with the Lord. So she knew some things. Other things she didn't know. She didn't know what lied between her, what there was between her and where Isaac was. She didn't know. There were many unknowns along the way. But she knew that the servant had all the necessary resources to make the journey successful. Think about it. When she said, I will go with this man. She'd probably never traveled that way before. She may have never been out of that little area where Bethuel and uh, Laban kept their herds. Yet she decides to go. Imagine the questions that she could have asked or the questions, the doubt that could have been in her mind. Think about it in your own walk with the Lord. All the what ifs, right? What if this happens or that happens? You know what I'm talking about. None of us knows what will happen between the time that we are called to walk with the Lord until the time we get to heaven. But dear hearts, we can rest in the sure knowledge that God knows the way and plans the road ahead. That's where we get our peace from. That's where we get our confidence from. Psalm 37, 25. The psalmist wrote this. I was young, and now I am old. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken, or their children begging bread. Think about it. We don't need to know all that's going to happen. Matter of fact, we're probably a lot better, and I'm going to say we are a lot better off not knowing What's going to happen between here and there? But praise God, we know that in Christ Jesus, we are going to make it. We're going to make it. <sighs> Not a single one who begins the journey with Jesus will fail to make it home. I'm telling you this, dear hearts. When you are saved, when you become a new creation, there is no chance of you not making it. When you are in Christ Jesus and you know that you have been forgiven, that you have repented of your sin and that you are walking with him, there is no doubt that you're going to make it. Why? Because Jesus guarantees, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you, none will I lose that the Father has given me. That's a wonderful promise. So, she didn't know the road. She didn't know how she would be received. When he sees her, when Isaac sees her, what's he going to think of her? He had never seen her before. Dad sent the servant out to find her. Will she be accepted? Will she be loved? Notice that all her fears are in vain in verse 67. It says, Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother Sarah and married Rebekah. All her fears would have been in vain. It's the same with us. We don't need to wonder whether Jesus will have us or not. Because he says, all who come to me are welcome. 
I will turn none away who come to me. We don't have to worry about the end of the journey. We don't have to worry about coming to him. You know, I can remember several times talking to people about coming to Jesus because I know that God has called, he's, he's invited us all. And so many people say, well, I just can't come the way I am. I've got some stuff in my life that I've got to clean up. i got to get my act together before I come to Christ. And I will tell you, based on personal experience, you cannot get your act together before you come to Christ because you need Christ to get your act together. You can't do it. you got to come just as you are. That's what she did. Her reward, she didn't know what her reward, what is in this for Rebecca? Think about it. I'm leaving my family, just like Abraham had to. I'm leaving everything I know. What's in it for me? Is this offer for real? Of course, we know on the other side of it that Rebecca gets a brand new family, a new father. She gets a great faith. All that the father had, Abraham, is now hers through Isaac. It reminds me of the fact that the world, this world, and our enemy, Satan, always tries to tell us that there is no payoff in serving God. But we need to remember this. The rewards for coming to Jesus are without number and without limit. I like the way the Apostle Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. We do have this one, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. The Apostle says, However, as it is written, and he knew if it was written, if it was a promise of God, that it was going to come to be. He knew it. He said this, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. How could he say such a thing? Because he was walking by faith. How could he say such a thing? Because he was caught up to the third heaven. Somehow, Paul was able to get a glimpse of what awaits those who put their faith in Christ Jesus. And he said, it's beyond the human eye. It's beyond the human ear. It's beyond the human mind to comprehend the glories that await those who trust in Christ. Rebecca was surprised, I'm sure, by the blessings that she had. So she was family. We know that she served and refreshed Abraham's messenger. But lastly, she was ready to go. And some things she knew and some things she did not know. Sounds like us, doesn't it? But she was also very sure of some things. She was willing to choose. Even though she does not know all there is to know about Isaac, she knows that she wants to be with him. She doesn't have all the information, but she has enough to choose. He sounds like just a man she wants to be married to. And isn't that what salvation and sanctification boil down to? Our wanting Him, Jesus, more than we want anything else in life. Being saved, sanctified, means coming to a place where we are willing to choose Jesus over our sin. Jesus over self. His will over our will. Do you see what I'm saying? It's the same. Salvation and sanctification. If we're going to get closer to Christ, closer to the goal, we have to choose His will over ours. Sin does not need to be our master anymore. All we need to do to break a habit of sin, and I don't care what it is, is love Him more than we love that thing. She was willing to go. She said, I want him more than anything that I have here. I will go. It always boils down, dear hearts, to the same choice in our lives. Do we want his will more than our own? Because once we decide that we love him more than we love our sin, then, then and only then, will we be sanctified and drawn closer to Him. We don't want to allow anything to stand between us 
and salvation or sanctification. Nothing that we can name in this world or in the world to come is more valuable than our relationship with Jesus Christ. Also, she comes to the place where she esteems Isaac as being so much more valuable than anything she already has. She's turning her back on everything to go with him. She's willing to live in a new place in a new way. And that's the essence, again, of our walk with the Lord. First for salvation and then for sanctification. She reaches the point where she is willing to commit the rest of her life to being Isaac's wife. She's willing to give her all to him. There's no place, dear hearts, in the church for this so-called easy believism. Because salvation and then sanctification that follows is a radical commitment to follow Jesus Christ for the rest of our lives without reservation. Sometimes we need to go back to the place where we accepted Christ as our Savior and remember what that was that drew us to Him. This knowing that we could be forgiven. This knowing that we could be washed from our sin. This knowing that we can change through Him. A radical commitment. You know, until this stranger came to town that day, Rebecca would have been living her life without any expectation of what was about to happen to her. She would have just been going about her everyday business. Suddenly a man walks into town and he tells her that he has been sent to ask her to be the bride of the son of the one who sent him. The messenger had only been in town for one night when he states that he wants to take her to his master. The family wants her to stay with them for a little while longer. Again, we see this idea that the family can be a hindrance to our commitment to the Lord. So she has to make a decision. She's asked to make a decision. She's been put in quite a position. If she's going to go with this man, she would have to leave her family behind at a moment's notice. You know, there were no fast ways to commute then, no cell phones to communicate on with her family. She would have to left them behind on a moment's notice. Yet, considering all that, we don't read of any hesitation here in Rebecca. She simply gets herself ready. She gets her maids ready. She jumps on a camel, and off she goes. The servant might not have waited if she would have hesitated. It's something that we'll never know. God requires the church, you and I, who call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ, to be ready in much the same way. The problem is that many in the church are constrained by the same things that holds back those who don't know Christ, the world's pleasures, whatever it is, and they're not willing to let go. And if we are to be the bride of Christ, and if we are to enter into the promises, then we need to be ready to leave behind everything that the world offers. She was willing to leave it all, including her own family. Rebecca entered into the promises of God because she was family. Because she was willing to serve and refresh the servant. And because she was ready and willing to go. Because she did these things. She became the mother of a great nation. She even finds herself in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And dear hearts, the return of Christ is the ultimate promise that we have. And we can enter into. Unless we are like Rebecca, we will never partake in the wedding feast described in the book of Revelation. God also has other promises for us as individuals and as a church. And the Holy Spirit is searching for those who are willing to enter in. The question is the same for us today as it was for Rebecca then. Will you go with this man? God has promises for your life and for my life. He has promises for the church. The servant, however, would have been released from his oath if Rebecca hadn't been willing. She would have missed out on the promises of God. Likewise, dear hearts, we often miss out 
on the promises of God simply because we are not willing. We are not willing to turn our back on whatever it is that is keeping us from saying, yes, I will go with this man. It's a challenge because we know that the only reason why God asks us to do anything is because He loves us. He loves us. And He would never Himself bring any harm on us. So He asks us this morning, will you go with this man? We're going to ask those who are going to close us to come forward now and close us. The question that the servant asked Rebecca is the same question that the Holy Spirit asks us. Will we go with this man? Let's stand and sing this song. It's another song about love. Jesus loves us. He calls us to a closer walk. He calls us to salvation. I don't know where you're at this morning, but if God has spoken to your heart, won't you respond and come? Isaac first loved her. This morning Jesus loves you. We have fallen in love with him. One more verse. to express thanks for the fact that you loved us so much that you sent your son to pay for our sins and then you sent your Holy Spirit to draw us to him who died for us oh how we love Jesus dismiss us now in your grace and peace may we remember as we go through this Valentine's Day in the week ahead that Jesus loves us we love you Lord and all God's people said Amen. Amen.